I, I'm thinking while listening to you about how you talked earlier about you're interested in the you're interested in, in things that are anarchic, an, the prefix an, and I'm thinking that maybe this is an an archive that be, because it's taxonomizing in a way that doesn't elucidate in traditional ways. It doesn't um, create a, a, a kind of a moment in history that can be saved. It's not a demonstration of power the way so many archives are. It's not doing any of the things that archives have been traditionally been tasked with. And yet at the same time, it's kind of like overdetermined in these specific ways. It has, I could, the concept oscillators, the cliches, the thousand categories, you could keep building those out forever. Um, so am I, am I off base in thinking about this as an an archive I, at all? No, I, I think that's actually the more, that's, that's, that, that's probably the, the, the more apposite term. Um, and of course, the idea of the an archive is also, again, it's sort of implicit in many, many theories of the archive, but I like the idea of an anarchive, when we think of it as sort of uh, an archive that starts to take place around a void. Um, because, you know, also in the heart of the word archive is the idea of the, of the archon and the archaeon. This is the place where the, the chief, the ruler, the magistrates sort of reside. And it is, it, it is the archons, the archivists, you know, who, who, who control entry into the archive, to this place that we've designated as the place where we're going to, you know, um, collect uh, documents, for example. Um, and I like the idea of, uh, of, a of, a, of, a, of, a, of a sort of placeless archive, um, this idea that there is a place, except for that place is a void. And then the archive starts to emerge around it except for it doesn't, it doesn't, it's not settled and it doesn't, it can't be located in that sense. Um, that might be a good metaphor for, uh, or a good analogy for, for the processes that we're using in our, in our, in our projects. A, a, a placeless place and a gap, which uh, brings me actually to wanting to talk to you a little bit about the Grupo Anarchitectura. Uh, I, don't recall that you have any background in architecture yourself, but uh, maybe you could explain if you do and also talk a little bit about the origins of this project and the research Rezark's uh, interest in Grupo and Architectura. Yeah, I would love to talk about that. I, um, so yes, that is true. I have no formal training as an architect, but since I was a uh, teenager, I've been, I've been an aficionado of architecture. I mean, and so, and I've just tried to, I mean, that, that's, that's pretty much where it stayed, is like in this beginner's sort of fascination with architecture, um, which I've tried, which I've, which I've desperately tried to, to preserve um, as, I, as, I, as I work on the, the Grupo, the, the, the An Architecture Group project. Um, uh, I did, I did happen to, however, <laughs> I, I did happen to write, I did happen to, I, I actually did a PhD. I, I wrote a dissertation. And in that dissertation, I wrote several chapters on modernist architecture. I, I did extensive research on Le Corbusier, um, the international style, uh, the various, um, the various sort of failures of modernism, the various um, perverse expressions of modernism in other parts of the world, for example, Latin America, um, uh, did a lot of research on the city of Brasilia and the work of Lucio Costa and Oscar Niemeyer. And so I um, went and, and, and actually here at UCLA, when I was teaching in the film school, I taught a course on film and architecture where I, um, where I spent a lot of time uh, reading about and working on um, all of the, not just the sort of modernism from like the early 20th century, but all of the kind of techno utopian avant-garde in Europe in the 1960s and 70s, like Archigram and Super Studio and, uh, and you know, Jonah Friedman and Constant and with his New Babylon and all that stuff. 
So um, all of that stuff is really in the sort of in the in the in the in the in the air when the the when Gordon Mata Clark is starting to starting to think about architecture and urbanism in New York City in the 1970s. I should say that actually there's a lot of disagreement about who coined the term and architecture. It probably wasn't Gordon Mata Clark, um, although it is closely associated with his, with his name. But that's actually one of the things that interests me especially, but it definitely interests us with the, with the, the project on uh, the Grupo Anarquitectura, which is which, which we've called the Argentinian branch, but really what interests us in this project is the, simul, the sort of the, the simultaneity of various anarchitectural projects happening in many parts of the world, um, not just in New York and not even just in, in Buenos Aires. We've, we've, um, we've discussed things happening in the Philippines around in the, in the late 1970s, uh, um, in South Africa, um, and so we're, we're hoping to expand our research into those areas as well. But essentially what brought me to the, the Anarchitecture Group, the Argentine branch of the Anarchitecture Group project was a series of serendipities or coincidences, however you wanna look at them, depending on whether you're a union or not. Um, but uh, I had been, reading a lot about uh, Gordon Mata Clark through all of that research that I was just talking about um, on modern arch modernist architecture. I had, I, I, I had done a lot of work on film and politics in the 1960s. I was very interested in, a, in, in, in the Filipino filmmaker Kid Laptahimik. Um, working, starting to work in the late 1970s in the Philippines. He made this fabulous little movie called Perfume Nightmare in 1978 that he made with his, with his cheap secondhand eight millimeter camera. Um, and what's crazy is that in, it, at one point in Perfume Nightmare, in a scene shot in Paris, because half the movie takes place in Paris, um, a work by Gordon Mata Clark just shows up. It just shows up. And it's there on the screen for about, I don't know, 30 seconds or so, and then it disappears. And there's no, there's no, there's no gloss, there's no reference, there's no mention of who, of who it is. We just see this work called Conical Intersect, which actually only existed in Paris for, for a couple of weeks. Because it had to be, it was, it was done. It was, it was, it was created in a building that was slated for demolition um, in 1976. So that sent me back to the work of Kid Latahim. I began to think about certain other moments in that film where ideas that seemed very similar to ideas that were circulating among this group around Gordon Mata Clark in New York in the 1970s also seemed to be working or operating in Kid Latahamik's film, albeit in very different ways. Um, for example, this idea of the fake estates. There's also um, a project of, an early project of Gordon Mata Clark's. We see many examples of, of sort of fake estates in the film uh, uh, Perfume Nightmare. Anyway, Fast forward to 2009, I am on a research trip in Buenos Aires and I'm walking around uh, a central, very central neighborhood, probably one of the oldest neighborhoods uh, in the center of town in what's called the Mitro Centro. Um, and I happen upon a, an unfinished highway ramp that's literally looming over the center of the oldest neighborhood in Buenos Aires. And I, who had spent many, many you know, long periods of time in the city of Buenos Aires had never once seen this uh, ramp before. And it just struck me as both too deliberate and too monstrous and too monstrously beautiful actually to be unintentional. And so I began to, I began to do research. I began to contact my colleagues in Ozark and we began to generate some some uh, some ideas around 
uh, around the work of what appears to be a clandestine collective of artists, militants, engineers, what have you, who among many other projects in the late 1970s and early 1980s uh, also managed to infiltrate um, the uh, huge public works project in Buenos Aires at the time, um, which was the creation of a, a whole slew of elevated highways, nine of them as a matter of fact, that were supposed to crisscross the city. They displaced whole neighborhoods of people uh, out to the slums in order to sort of uh, and sort of make way for the highway, but also as kind of a form of urban cleansing. Um, and uh, they seem to have uh, sort of infiltrated the project and diverted it into this un this uncompleted highway. Road. So, so it's actually an act of an act of uncompletion um, that that we find very interesting. What a rich story, honestly. Uh I can see how Grupo and Architectura is intersecting with Rezark becomes a kind of focusing lens for you to think about these, the way we haven't thought enough about our own past histories around certain areas of our architecture or architectural practice, particularly things like urban development. So it allows you to kind of keep looking back in history without simply revisiting it the way the standard historians do, but actually trying to interpolate a different history that might then move forward to today in a slightly different route. Um, and I think it's quite interesting. I wanted to ask you, uh, fake estates, that's a great term, um, I must say. I, I, I don't really have a question around that, but I, I think about how archives are a form of fake estate, uh, of a place that you claim, but that isn't physically tied down in a certain way. And the way Grupo and Architectura is claiming this giant um, freeway. So this, again, that fits in with sort of the fictive artist's model of making claims, which are ultimately perhaps not substantial in ordinary terms, but the whole point is the making of the claim and what it leads to in terms of a conversation or a dialogue. Um, I don't want to, us to run out of time for for viewer questions. So can I just, before we move to that, can I ask you to talk a little bit about what else you're working on or where, and perhaps any off branches of this that you see uh, about to, to spring forth? Absolutely. If I could just add incidentally that the, um, that the ramp, the off, the, un the uncompleted and I don't say incomplete, it was uncompleted. The uncompleted off-ramp has actually now been connected to a new highway project in Buenos Aires, um, which actually runs underground, not above ground. Um, so, so actually the, that, that, work, that work of the, the, the Argentine branch of the Grupo Ana, uh, the Ana Arquitectura no longer exists um, as such in the middle of Buenos Aires. Um, what am I? What am I working? Yes. So um, I, I'm. I'm still. Do, I'm working a lot on the, the anarchitecture series, which are the cardboard sculptures. Um, and that's been a really interesting um, line of, of inquiry for me. Um, but I'm also about to embark on an, another major fictive project. I guess you could call it um, quasi fictive. I'm always maybe. I think the better word is speculative. Um, and I'll leave it to the experts to determine whether it's also fictive. Um, but I am going to be um, collaborating with or intervening in the, in, in the collections of an, of an organization in Sion, Switzerland called the Fondation Fellini uh, pour le cinéma, which is essentially a, 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 an archive dedicated to the work of Federico Fellini. Um, in Sion, of all places, in the French Alps, uh, because the artistic director, longtime artistic director of, of Fellini's, uh, was was linked, was connected to that town, and donated all kinds of memorabilia and other and other sort of uh, objects. Um, uh, and they've created a whole archive and a whole exhibition space around this um, around this collection. And I am going to be making some interventions into those collections and creating uh, an installation out of that work. Um, and it is, um, it's all organized around, well, 
I should say tentatively, organized around a very strange piece of fan mail that Fellini received from, uh, from somebody in Argentina, yet again. I don't know what, everything keeps sort of sending me back to Argentina. As a matter of fact, the, 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 the person who composed most of the music for most of Fellini's films after eight and a half was an Argentinian composer. And it might've been through him that this fan wrote to Fellini asking to be an extra in one of his films. So here we are again with film extras and um, a strange figure from abroad and Fellini. Um, so I'll be reading up on my Jung. Why Fellini? Um, well, I can't answer that question. <laughs> I can't answer that question because the opportunity came to me. I didn't seek it out. Um, so I, when I, I, I met the director of the Fondation Fellini years ago, um, and you know, as a, as a person who spent a lot of time watching movies from the 1960s, mainly Latin American, well, not just Latin American films, all kinds of, all the movies from the 1960s, um, bad and good. Um, I've happened to watch a lot of Fellini films. And so I was interested to, and he, I was interested to meet the director of the Fondation Fellini. And as soon as he told me about the archives, I asked if I could see them. And when he brought me to see them, I started looking at fan mail and one thing led to another. So I have to ask this too. I was recently thinking about fan fiction and how it's become such a huge genre in our time to the point where there are now numbers of book-like projects because they're not being published as books, they're being published on the web that are millions of words long, uh, created by often quite small communities of writers. Uh, and so the minute that you interpolate yourself into the life history of somebody as famous as Fellini, there is the potential for a fan fiction modality of thought to emerge. Do you have interest yourself in fan fiction as a genre is, or is this sort of just me waffling? I don't have yet a personal vested interest in fan fiction as a genre. However, I love the idea that something, some project that I am involved with suddenly sort of takes on a life of its own in the hands of an anonymous community of creators. I will say that that was an aspiration of the Balak Archive project that never was realized. Um, that I, you know, we had hoped that others upon visiting the Balak Archive would be interested in getting involved and that we could invite people to curate uh, sections of the Balak Archive or create their own installations out of elements of the, of the existing elements of the Lock Archive and, and elements that they, would, that they would generate, that they would create, which would then become part of the, the archive. Um, so no, I don't, I, I can't even claim to know much about fan fiction, but I love the idea that maybe some fan fiction could, could, could be spawned by a little project of mine in Sion, Switzerland in the Fondation Fermini. You never know, right? Uh... Gordy, I think maybe this would be a good moment to turn it over to questions. Great. We've got some great questions. Um, well, Greg, this is a question from Eleanor. Eleanor. Uh, many architects create projects that cannot and never will be built. Have you considered investigating a fictive architect? How might that be different from the an architecture investigation? Oh, I love that question. Um, uh, I have not yet considered a, a project around the figure of a, a, a sort of a fictional architect, but I am very interested in speculative architecture. Um, and, and, and so all of the, all of the, many of those, those avant-garde groups, those collectives that I, that I mentioned from back in, in Italy and England and France um, in, the, in the 1970s, Super Studio, Archigram. Uh, uh, um, uh, there's even a collective of, of architects and artists here in the United States called Ant Farm um, that did some really interesting things with, with speculative architecture. They ended up trying to build um, inflatables and things like that. 
but yes, uh, Eleanor, I, 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 I am really interested in that stuff. And um, I think it inform it's, it's actually, it's sort of, it's, it's, it's there, it's in the back of my mind as I'm creating these, uh, these, these cardboard sort of quasi architectural cardboard sculptures. Um, those are definitely speculative structures, um, to say the least. Uh, Antoinette, any uh, further uh, lasting comments before we take it away? Um, Greg, uh, just to follow up a little bit on this question of mock architecture, there are artists working in mock architecture as well as on our sort of the fictive side of the fence and then speculative architecture. Um, what, what is it that keeps your work not being speculative architecture? Because I think I just heard you say it's not, it's something adjacent to that. And is it, do you see it not as speculative, like truly speculative architecture because you don't have architectural training or because you are, you're not really thinking about buildings in their functions, but building with a, as a verb? Or uh, am I off the mark here? I'm just sort of curious about how you yourself are parsing out some of those distinctions. Well, I, I think what I said was I, I I hadn't I really hadn't considered creating a fictive project around the figure of a of a of an architect um, per se. Um, but um, but yes, that said, I I like that formulation. This idea that I think perhaps what more interests me is not the buildings but building um and 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 so building and it's sort of open-ended um open-ended kind of aleatory sort of aspect um so when i'm creating for example when i'm creating those structures i don't have an i don't have i, I don't draw them in advance for example i don't have a i don't design them um, they emerge um, and each, each layer that is placed on the structure as it's, as, it's, as it's emerging determines how I will place or locate the next layer as I begin to build it up and out. Um, I mean, and I might, have, I might have a vague sense of, of sort of certain gestures in mind um, with these structures, um, but they're really, really sort of base note. They're in the background. Um, I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, no, that, that's actually very helpful. I also, I'm sorry, I wanna ask you one last question that is, um, comes up a lot with four fictive artists and I can't recall if it's come up for you. This question of how we often find ourselves dodging and weaving around the storytelling so as to not admit things we don't want to admit to create, to keep alter egos or um, parts of the story ambiguous as to their reality to not have to get backed into a corner. And there are people who will try very hard to back you into a corner because it's important to them to somehow know for sure what kind of story you're telling. So I was wondering if you've had those experiences how do you deal with them? Do they make you uneasy? What is your sort of general strategy for, for not getting pinned down when you don't want to be pinned down about the truth or fiction of what you're saying at any given moment? Yeah, I can't even, I, I can't even tell you how many times I've been <laughs> backed into a corner <laughs> um, unwillingly. Um, and I wish I could say that I had a good strategy for dealing with it. Um, I think it's really, um, I think in the end, it's, it's really to turn sort of the focus back towards the idea of speculation and, and, get, and try, to, try, to, try, try not to get caught up in the idea of, of the fictive. Um, this is the peril, the great peril of fictive art is that it's got the word fictive in it and it's um, and it and it and it and people get really bent out of shape when something looks like history, but is or is passing as history, but may not be. Which is, you know, if we all would read a little bit of 
don't know. That's going to be, I'm the side. I was about to say something very pedantic, but, but we could, but I think, you know, a lot of people know, or a lot of people understand that history, the writing of history uses all the same conventions as the writing of fiction. Um, but there's very little distinction between the two often at the level of narration and that um, they are different frames. They are different, they are different ways of sort of uh, framing a certain kind of, um, uh, a certain fragment of reality in order to see if we can access some deeper layer of the real. Um, that's the way I understand it anyway. So I try to divert towards sort of this idea of an outward open-ended kind of speculative process. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. I appreciate your take on that. Uh, I don't have any more questions, Gordy. And is there any more from the audience? If not? No, we're all set. But I'd like to thank you all for coming today. And Greg, this was fascinating. It's just one more door that's opened up in this world of fictive art that I'm just learning so much. So again, thank you so much for joining us today. And many thanks to Double House Press for publishing such a fine book, Sting in the Tail, Art, Hoax, and Provocation. Coming up in our series on fictive art, Professor Lafarge will speak with artist Lenore Malin on March 2nd. The discussion will begin at 5 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. And again, thank you for joining us. This is Gordy Grundy for artreporttoday.com. Wishing you good night.